Okay, our final presentation is by Richard James and Chris Franks, both from Newcastle University, who are talking about uh, Rapid, which is uh, related to Raptor, Thank which you. we heard about earlier. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Um, I realise that we're just before lunch, so we'll try not to keep it for too long. Also, apologies if anything that we cover in this session crosses over with what we talked about earlier, but hopefully we'll give you a bit more of a sort of our experience of actually trying to deploy Raptor um, at Newcastle University. Um, so yeah, myself and Chris work at Newcastle University. We look after um, Shibboleth, Grouper, um, we run an institutional data feed service. So there's quite a few sort of different things that we, we look after. Um, we've both had quite a bit of experience in the past with GIST projects, um, G5O, ID Maps, Grand, which have all looked at um, taking sort of new te technologies and trying to implement them at Newcastle University. So that's how we first got sort of working with Shibboleth and with Group the Group Management System. And they're now all embedded at Newcastle University as sort of, um, very mature services. Um, so yeah, for this session, what we really wanted to do is sort of let you know why we wanted to start looking at Rafta at Newcastle University. Actually, sort of look at, talk briefly about some use cases that we identified where, where we were interested in. Um, and then Chris will talk a bit more about the actual implementation of, of Raptor, how we found it, and then sort of taking it from there to see where we want to go for the future with Raptor. Um, and also sort of any ideas which we might feel like Raptor could move into, um, which we seem to <coughs> might be interested in or might not be. Um, and then at the end we can share some sort of resources that we've we've got. Um, so yeah, mm -hmm. the first reason for us really wanting to, wanting to do this, as Chris has nicely put it on this slide, is that the logs just look weird. <coughs> if you go into them, unless you study logs on a daily basis, it's very difficult to understand exactly what they're telling you. Um, and each log <coughs> is different in structure, so there's no sort of real um, relation between them all. So it can end up, once you're scrolling through the screen, it just looks a bit like a like matrix. You can use grep, <coughs> but I'm not that clever enough to do that sort of stuff. So this is why we want to start to look at something like Raptor. Um, another way is, another thing is, once you, if you do get an understanding of one log file, actually being able to identify trends through that log file is very difficult. You can just get a basic sort of overview um, of, what, of what that's trying to tell you. And it's also to really build up a, a big picture of what's actually going on um, with sort of, for, for example, for the use of Shibboleth. It's useful to start bringing other bits of data in. So <coughs> sort of um, extra attributes about sort of if it's a student who's logged in or, or a staff member. In doing that just with raw log files is very, very difficult. So yeah, that's that's a log entry, and that's why we think it's weird, and it's <laughs> it's not um, very understandable. Um, in the past, we've used sort of myself and Chris from a technical perspective, <coughs> probably not this log, but other logs we use as more. You look at it to identify any sort of performance issues, so more technical computing issues. So if a machine needs more CPU because it's struggling to perform, that's how we've sort of used logs in the past. It hasn't been used um, for sort of determine, um, providing information for libraries and other <coughs> departments to determine whether their resources and their services are actually being used and helping to sort of provide information for um, resourcing decisions. So that's why we've we moved to Raptor. So get rid of the weird logs and bring in graphs. I was going to say everyone loves graphs, but after the first session, not everyone loves them, but the majority. Um, but that's a much nicer way of providing it to sort of your very high management. Um, so our director would absolutely love that, sort of just to see sort of an overview of what's going on. Um, and I think it's, even for libraries, having that sort of I think if you look at it sort of from the, more of the group and perspective, so being able to group it by schools, they can see which schools are going to their services that they're sort of providing and paying quite a bit of money for. 
in making sure that sort of funding's all, all in the right places. If you have a log file, you can't you can't really get that information. Um, the way we we approach this project is very much from a use case perspective. We've done that in the past with other projects, and we found it really useful. It helps us sort of quantify exactly what what the project's all about, and also helps us to go out and speak to the project stakeholders and help them guide the work that we want to sort of we were going for. So we spoke with the library. Um, we also also spoke to the their, um, learning technologies team who provide a lot of the M applications around the university. So we got them involved throughout the project to make sure the work that we were going to be doing actually sort of fit, fit their requirements. Um, so I mean, the, the main two are the shibboleth and the easy proxy. Um, like you've seen, the shibboleth logs we just had on our server. We never, we never sort of used them for any um, resourcing decisions or anything like that. They just, they just sat there. We did in the, the last project. We tried to take that information and use. Um, we use a data integration tool called Talent um, to run our institutional data feed service. We tried to pause the log files using that, which we found was an improvement on just gripping the files, but it was still quite laborious. There was still having that initial understanding of how that that file was made up. Um, and it wasn't really, at the end of it, you still didn't have the nice graphs or anything like that. You just still had, in effect, sort of the raw data, but maybe it's a bit more, more structured. With Raptor, what we, this is why sort of Raptor, um, we started looking at Raptor. So we could start graphing this information, the number of unique authentications, grouping by um, schools, affiliation, so staff, students. And it just helps to give that enrich that data and sort of build a bigger bigger picture. Um, for easy proxy, that's a relatively new um, thing at the university, I think early last year and a half. Yeah, about a year and a half. Um, and that's really been pushed out quite um, quite a lot by our library. Um, this is where sort of if you look at Raptor, another way of providing sort of good information is by looking at the um, the data that Raptor is producing, you can see exactly how much how much use Easy Proxy is getting. It helps to ensure that the money that they've actually paid to um, implement Easy Proxy has been worthwhile. And it also, from another view, is that making sure that end users are actually aware that this service is in place. Instead of going, <coughs> sort of previously they had to go via remote um, desktop connection, sort of our RAS service. And it's just layer after layer to get to the um, the content. But now with Easy Proxy, it should make it a lot simpler. But it's just making sure that people are actually aware that that service exists. Um, we also, at the beginning of the project, we we wanted to take it further than just Shibboleth and Easy Proxy. We wanted to start to look at other applications. So Grouper is quite a big thing at um, Newcastle University. We kind of use that as sort of the the first sort of building block for trying to look at in, in different areas. So we've we just wanted to do sort of simple things of maybe seeing how many groups have been created and the period of time, how many have been deleted. And that helps us to measure the growth and use of Grouper um, and making sure that that application is sort of able to, to go with any um, sort of the load that it's getting. Um, and that was we also wanted to start, I think Chris will go into this a little bit more, but we also wanted to look at sort of IT cluster rooms, so um, being able to graph sort of how many um, people are going logging on their cluster room machines, seeing which which schools their people are affiliated with and seeing whether they should actually be using them cluster rooms. Um, but I'll not steal any more from Chris in case. Do. Carry on. Oh, I'll let you go. This is how we went about implementing this thing really. Uh, we wanted to get, as Richie said, trends and usage information and easily parsable information for humans, not, not just for machines. So we looked at Raptor. Um, there are also sort of data collection tools you can use, but what Raptor does, <coughs> it's said to wrap it, wrap it all up in one if that's not too many wraps. But because you have the attribute association thing there as well, we could get better demographics for the schools for 
A for the schools and B of the schools for for the library and uh, the department. It's got that support for the Meeting property we said we kind of wanted to take it further. Wrapped as an authentication um, looking to monitoring tool, but authentications and people doing things are the same can be seen as the same thing. So if I open an application, say I've not authenticated to it, but I, a user, have done something, and we want to to log things like that as well and see how applications have been used and that's the extensible part of RAP2 which we'll get onto later. <coughs> Technically it's not very technical, this slide anyway. You've got the ICA as, um, as Risa said earlier, I guess you guys know this, you've got a client and a server and a database and we generally separate out the database because the MUA is the, MUA is the multi-unit aggregator which sort of collects all this information. I should say it's given all that information. Uh, other log analysis, all of the kind of data collection tools like Munin, I don't know if you know that, go out and the server goes and collects information from a client. That client could be your IDP or easy proxy server. If they're busy doing stuff, then Munin still goes to them and tries to get logs and puts more load on them. Okay, thank you. Um, what Raptor does is the, the client, the, <coughs> the Shib IDP, the Shib SP, decides when it's ready to push out logs and that could be by the amount of time since the last time it did it, or the amount of logs it's got in memory, in its little parsing. So it pushes that out when it's ready to any way, which collects it, shoots it in the database, does some statistics on it, and makes that available to the web front end. Um, the web front end we generally do run the same box as the MUA. It's fairly you know, all right. It's in its lightweight. I mean, I'm, this is, it's certainly not causing us too much trouble. Uh, the default install uses Postgres, and that's, that's fine to get you started off. We've got more of a MySQL skill set, so we changed to use that. And as we did that, we found it easier to, to watch what was going into the database and see these big, big numbers appear. And we've got four and a half million entries in our Shibboleth uh, table alone at the minute. So we're kind of pleased that it's still chugging away and doing that. In order to get that many logs in, we had to separate separate out the uh, database to a separate machine because there was just far too much. I think it was this guy that was that was really getting hammered in the box. So we separated out the database, and he's now looking fine. The database itself is about a gig and a half big, uh, but I think the amount of temporary tables and things that get created when you do queries mean that it expands and contracts quite a lot. So put it in its own box. It's working fine. The web front end. By default, runs on port 8112, which is which is fine if you know that, but it's just easy to front it with Apache Sickness SSL certificate on it and just go there without uh, any special ports. So we installed the client on, as Richie said, the Easy Proxy system, SHIB IDP. Then with the new version that came out, you can now install it on an SP. So rather than seeing the uh, IDP's point of view is in we've got all these different services and these things logging into it. If you only just focus on one service, one particular application, say, you can see what's happening from that point of view. That's a small graph of that, so what's that a day, is it? Yeah, that's the day who's logged into this SP, this that many authentications. It says there's only one user, that means there's one identity provider. This is uh, uh, an SP that we keep on campus for on campus access only. <coughs> So they'll be add our IDP as log users into it. Graphs, gratuitous graphs, sorry, but this kind of illustrates the kind of dashboard you'll get when you log in to the web front end. Uh, things like this is for our easy proxy service, and you can see here we've got the number of authentications to a particular service provider. So what's the time there? Linking hub seems to be our top service provider there. And you've also got the number of unique users. So although a user may have authenticated three or four times, you then get the amount of users that's actually gone into that. And that college pretty much the same. Uh, it's worth saying that there are some little options here, uh, such as internal external resources. As I just said, we've got, we've got SPs that are just for on-campus use, and there are .nsl.ac.uk domains, and we can separate those out from external things, external sites. Uh, if you want to see how how they compare. 
Okay, and you, you can customize actual graphs. I've stolen this from the old key, sorry, but it sounds like a good picture. You can, you know, set, set date ranges there. You can set how you want to um, group things. You can give it a title. You can then perform filtering. So you can, after you've got all this data, you can sort it sort of uh, from lowest use to highest use, or from highest to lowest use. You can just take the top two, the bottom two. You can you can filter out things once you've generated this graph by just clicking update. And once you've got the graph itself, you can export to PDF, as been said, and get an, get an Excel spreadsheet there. So basically, you've got something to go and give someone who can make decisions. Because generally, the techies are people that, well, I hope the librarians, the people that do this, don't have the authority to make decisions. They can just inform decisions. <coughs> you can take these graphs and take these tables to whoever gets to do that. These are recommendations if you're going to start using the Raptor tool. Uh, I've started small. I've just installed the thing, as, as Ree said, just if you're on Unix, just you install Raptor all and just let it run. Log something small. We started with Easy Proxy because it was a pretty new service at the time. Get that in the Postgres database, and then once you're happy that it's doing what it should do, separate out the database because once things get big, it's going to need to be, and leave it running there. So that's working. We have an attribute database um, from a previous project that we ran, an institution data feed thing, so we know pretty much everything about users and can have them all in one place if we want. So we know what school, what department, what type of student you are. Uh, and I would have that handy and we put that on the same database as our MUA's database so that there's not just to keep things together I think. And better documentation is not having a go at the documentation set already. It's really good and it got us all the way through what we've done. But I think as more people start to use Raptor and it gets more it, it gets more sort of I want to say use it as it becomes more popular. We're all going to do different things with it, but then again, we're all going to do the same thing with it. So we may as well share what we've got. And there's a community section of the wiki here where if you, for instance, decide to parse a different type of log file from the easy proxy and the ship one that's there, you can put your, your class up there. It will explain how to do it. In the future, as Richie said, we're going to look at group for logging, application logging. We've got computer clusters around campus, and every time someone opens or closes Microsoft Word, that's logged into a database somewhere and obviously we know who's logged into that machine so we can fairly assume that that user is doing that. We can then find out which schools are using Excel, which schools are using Word and things like that just to create more of a breakdown of information. This is something we want to look into in the project we didn't quite get time to do. If you've got 8,000 users in your Active Directory and 7,000 logging in. What about the other 1,000? Who are they and why aren't they logging in and what's happening with them? I know that's a bit more user specific and this is, most of this is about anonymizing data and providing group data. But again, if you've got a student that's disengaged with the course, disengaged with IT, it might be that they're not, they're not on the right track with their course. The web front end at the minute has just one level of user, which is an admin user who can see everything, do everything. We might want to make, and this is sort of how we feel, we might want to make an interface to the database which will allow different levels of user to do different things with the data and things that are tailored to what they would want to do. So if you're a management login, they don't want to know everything that's around there, they just want to see certain types of graphs for certain periods, and we could give that to them on a more sort of individual level uh, using things like shapes to do a single sound to the interface so they know what they are. Uh, I've got a couple of minutes left, but really <coughs> we've done. I just want to point you at the Raptor website. Go there. It's the documentation's absolutely great. It gets you through what you need to do. It's not complete, but if you want to take part, if you're doing things with Raptor, email Reese, email Phil. it will give you a login. It's a wiki. You can write your own pages. Stick them in the community a bit, and we'll help with helping you scroll. Our project website's here. Uh, we've got a more a more lengthy version of this presentation really in our project report and lots of other outputs from the project there including the use cases that we have talked about. Do go and have a look and if you want to ask us any questions about this um, email us or talk to us over lunch and we'll be happy to tell you what we can. Uh, thank you.